very clear that we're currently uh, operating in unprecedented and extraordinary times. And uh, although the COVID-19 initially was a not naturally a, a massive uh, global health crisis, it is now quite clear that um, it's having a major knock-on effect on the economy. And whilst we all respect and uh, putting things into perspective that health must be the first priority, uh, thereafter then, when you must think of recovery, as they say, uh, you start to think of uh, what are the opportunities. And without doubt, the hospitality and tourism sector is one sector which has been particularly uh, hard hit. I mean, if you look at Northern Ireland here, I think Minister Diane Dodd, the economy minister, said in the last week or so that she estimated that the annual turnover of the sector was 1.9 billion and that there were 65,000 jobs approximately in the Northern Ireland sector. And uh, oh, well, resilience in, in terms of that sector, I think it's, uh, it's the same as any sector, uh, albeit there are specific things relevant to tourism and hospitality. The first thing is, I think that um, we have to try and have an agile strategy and uh, an agile culture uh, within our business. And uh, what that basically means is that we're building a business that hopefully will be able to adapt to changing circumstances. Now, uh, in terms of the immediate impact, I think that um, uh, many business owners now are getting over the initial shock of uh, COVID-19 and are starting to at least prepare, albeit that feature is still unknown and uncertain, but they're starting to think about how they're going to recover. But before I suppose it got to that stage, um, they have to look first of all at what are the potential impacts on their business as of now. And I think quite a few of them have done that. And really, in very simple terms, you look at four key impacts. One, you look at revenues. You know, what is the impact is COVID-19 having on revenues? Now, we look at the tourism and hospitality sector, to be honest. Virtually, they're all shut in, in, in accordance with current uh, government guidelines here in Northern Ireland. Uh, so the revenue stream has virtually collapsed. Now, some of them uh, have uh, uh, slightly divert, uh, uh, what would you say, uh, went into further expansion and doing more takeaways, et cetera. But the truth is diversified and takeaways, et cetera. But the truth is that a significant proportion of revenues have disappeared in the short term. And then you look at your, your cost base. Um, you know, you think again, looking at hospitality and tourism, there's a number of unique things. So you look first of all, what's called your fixed costs. And they're probably costs that you're going to incur anyway. Uh, you're within light and heat, you'll have core light and heat, you'll have core security costs. Um, you could well have core uh, uh, f finance or HP costs in some regards. And you'll have core life policies potentially, uh, income protection schemes, uh, key man insurance schemes. But then you get you look at other areas like, for example, your your cold room or your uh, your, your your coolers or your refrigerators. Uh, even t if in, the, in accommodation, your TVs, they need to be turned on and off every couple of weeks or whatever. And you, you try and reduce your costs as far as possible. But recognizing, and this is the fundamental point, recognizing that you want to be in a position to exploit the recovery when it comes. So th that's the cost base. And uh, again, there's certain areas you can defer costs. For example, HP, you can go to your HP provider. Uh, similarly, obviously, the, the government uh, and the Northern Ireland Executive, you could Northern Ireland have both brought in a number of schemes and you know they have been of help, you know, whether it be the, um, the job retention scheme in some instances, whether it be the loan scheme. And, and obviously, um, you have the, the new scheme just brought in yesterday, which I think would be particularly helpful to the uh, tourism and hospitality sector, the, the, the bounce back loan scheme for between two and 50,000 uh, pounds. And again, if we wish, we can go back and talk about that in more detail. And then obviously you had the, the, the rates holiday from, uh, from uh, Conor Murphy for three months and he's coming under a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure from the sector to see what the extent that are make it more, more targeted. And obviously then you had the, the 25,000 uh, pound grants. So uh, these are all ways in terms of costs, but then you move on. So we've covered revenue and we've covered costs. You, you then move on basically to staff. And there's a number of key issues there in terms of staff, because if you think about it, um, a lot of the hospitality and tourism have been able to furlough or furlough their staff. But ultimately, you have to look at, is there some core staff there that you have to keep on because there'll be a massive demand, very skillful. And again, you have to look at how do you keep in contact with your staff regularly during this time? 
you know, it's not all about money. Are you showing an interest? Do you think that they would be loyal to you when you come back? Uh, and then having looked at that, you then go on to the final stage, which is the broad thing of finance. And the truth is in the current environment, the number, number one priority is your business, but you won't have a business if you don't have cash. So cash is king and you need to sit down and try and do uh, cash flow forecasts and look at what you think will be the sustainability of the business. Now that's in terms of resilience as now, but then we talk then about resilience going forward. And resilience going forward is starting to plan for the recovery. It's starting to, to recognize that, you know, uh, the, the market we come back to won't be the, the same market we left, that there will be behavior and attitude changes. I think uh, that's, quite well anticipated now. I think you're going to see far greater emphasis perhaps on, on in terms of eating habits on healthy foods and perhaps uh, vegan and perhaps uh, gluten free and perhaps foods that uh, will enhance the, the immune system or people will perceive they'll enhance the immune system. And then you have the whole area of booking. When somebody goes to book in the future, uh, maybe they'll not just be booking the food. They might be asking the question, what are your social distancing arrangements? Um, you know, so there's a little bit of a thought process there that has to go into that, and we'll come back to that more in the, in the course of our chat. I was reading recently that the Harvard, uh, the Harvard Business School carried out detailed research after the last uh, global financial crisis in 2008, and amazingly, one of the things they concluded was that in the, in, in that time of crisis, uh, businesses. Uh, in, in many instances, overmanaged and underlaid. So what I mean by that is, I think if the, what they've got to do first of all is, is to start, even though the business may not be operating at present, to start working on the business and thinking about where are they going to, how can they be resourceful? How can they be innovative? How can they enhance the capability of their limited resources because of revenue? Now in terms of staff, certainly they've got to keep in contact with staff. There's no good beating around the bush, you know, you've got to keep in contact with your staff on a regular basis. Look, it's all about, it's all about trying to, to, as we said, first of all, we're trying to be innovative. Like for example, I give you a few examples I've observed myself. Uh, I will not name clients, but one of my clients who's, um, who is a combination of a very nice uh, pizza Italian restaurant, then a pizza place and three or four carriots. All his places closed. But actually what he did was he, he decided after about two weeks um, that he had all these kitchens and he had all this skill. How could, he, how could he adapt to the current situation? So he came up with this idea that he would make a, a pizza kit. And uh, he put it in a normal pizza box. And basically he gave you uh, two pots of dough. He give you uh, tomato sauce in a bowl, and he give you mozzarella cheese in a bowl. And believe it or not, put it into a pizza box. Uh, it went on to uh, Facebook, uh, did a YouTube video to show you how to make the pizza, make your own pizza. And this has taken off. He's, he's currently doing over a thousand a day of these boxes. Um, he started off uh, trialing them in one or two local shops. I think he's now at the 10 shops. And uh, so this is amazing. People are now making their own pizzas, but they're using his dough and they're using his, you know. And so he's, he's utilizing, if you think about it, he's utilizing some of the staff he had in his restaurant. They're now working in his, his kitchen unit. He, he's able to use social distancing within that. He's, um, he's utilizing his premises. And he's utilizing some of his assets, his, his equipment assets. And more importantly, he's differentiating because he had an, a uniqueness in terms of the dough on his pizza. Now that's very, very smart. Uh, I, I, I've equally come across an, another, uh, perhaps somebody anticipated in the future in that um, you know, professional exams in particular, you think of medicine exams, accountancy law, et cetera. Uh, they still hope to go ahead in many instances. And what the, one of the issues now is social distancing two meters apart in an exam hall. Now you do have people, for example, Chartered Accountants Ireland have recently done some e-exam, e-distance exam. But equally, there are some firm people believe that for an exam condition, it's good to be in an exam hall. So uh, I've noticed one or two people in the hospitality industry are now offering their premises for uh, examinations. And the reason being that one of the challenges for people organizing large examination sittings is that you're, you're down to, because if you think about it, all the people can't go in together either. 
you have to stage them just like retail shops. So you, this is what you're talking about. I think you have another example in London I read where one of the top fine dining restaurants have entered into a collaboration, I think with Uber and one or two other um, transport businesses. And what they're doing is, though the chef is not going to your home because of social distancing, they're actually bringing fine dining to your home. So, by, so again, you're talking about smart collaboration between uh, a, a, a business that has a very good brand and fine dining and utilizing then somebody else who has the skills to transport it to the, to the customer. There'll always be new opportunities, but I think uh, we also have to face reality. COVID-19 is, is, having, is having and will have a very serious economic impact uh, on, on the non-Ireland economy, and in particular on the tourism and hospitality sector. Uh, so yes, there will be opportunities and people will be smart to observe those opportunities. And you know, if the truth is told, getting back to what we talked about initially, connecting with staff and clients, empowering staff and allowing things to evolve within that type of culture that you run your business. You know, the, the core facets will remain the same. If you have a good business, if you had a good product, it isn't gonna disappear overnight. But there will have to be innovation in how you bring it to recognize those new changing behaviors that we're anticipating will come back. It's also fair to say, to be honest, from a tourism perspective, uh, that the, the same amount of uh, international tourists will not be expected in the medium, uh, in the short to medium term. So therefore, one will be targeting both the Northern Ireland domestic market and our uh, visitors from Ireland, uh, from the south of Ireland to come. And again, that will probably require a different mix. you will be trying to highlight the, our natural assets, whether it be hill walking, whether it be fishing, uh, whatever, and trying to convince people of the attractiveness uh, of, um, uh, of holidaying at home. And uh, I certainly think that some of the people offering uh, self-catering accommodation, et cetera, you know, will try and have single households coming to them. And, you know, there will be, I think you will have people uh, trying to be creative and innovative. But I think the most important thing here, we've got to be honest, is the long-term health of our community, long-term health of society. So not sacrificing in any way uh, the guidelines from our public health professionals. Oh, that's fundamental, but that's something you should have been doing before. But, you know, there's an old saying, uh, our current circumstances don't determine where we go. They merely determine where we start. Because so if we weren't doing them before, well, then we've got to do it now. We've got to find out how we can empower our staff. For example, are we encouraging our staff at this time to do continuing professional education, to build up their skills? Uh, for example, I, again, another client of ours have been doing fantastic work through social media. They have a different members of their chefs doing menus on the on social media and the, the amount of feedback they're getting from customers and clients. And, you know, we've got to also recognize that one of the popular, one of the sectors of our population, which has been really seriously affected presently uh, is our senior citizens or those over 65. They were really a, quite a key market for the, for the hospitality sector. And they were people that a little bit of time were going quite often to, to restaurants, et cetera. And because of social distancing and isolation, uh, a particularly harder presence. So again, how have you kept in contact with those customers? So it's a combination of keeping your staff involved, keeping them encouraged and maybe to, to use this slight downturn to enhance their training or their competency or their skills in certain areas. There's very good online training out there at present that people can avail of. And uh, really, I think it's all about making the best of one's current circumstances. You know, um, I had an old mentor who used to say, Fergal used to say, you can't control what happens around you, but you can control how you respond. And there is no doubt that the fittest businesses will survive. And if we're being honest, we've had people in the hospitality and tourism sector who've come through the troubles. Oh, you know, the late Billy Hastings, you know, I remember watching a documentary on oh, oh, phenomenal with the man chief. You know, and we have many other examples of people in Northern Ireland who have shown a level of resilience which you could never imagine. So I do believe people will be resourceful. They'll be, they'll be energized, there'll be determination. I think equally, uh, the community, the public will want to help businesses, but I don't want, and I think we should not undermine 
the, the gravity of the challenge that faces businesses going forward. Now, I think the government uh, have tried, along with an online executive, brought, brought in a number of issues. I see, for example, uh, the Minister Dodds is also, uh, I think, launching an all Ireland hospitality uh, task force to look at the sector. But, um, you know, I, I think there's other things that can be looked at. I think uh, no, perhaps a VAT might be something. I mean, for example, the German government in the last few days have announced uh, a new VAT rate of 7% on food. Uh, from from the 1st of July. Uh, down south, you remember at the time of the last economic recession, the collapse, they used VAT as a major factor, uh, uh, market intervention factor in the tourism sector. And uh, where they reduced VAT down, I think, to 5 or 9%, at one stage 9% now. So again, that, that those are the type of things that we're going to be asking people to to consider. But I think equally, uh, our, we're fortunate in Northern Ireland that we do have some very good natural uh, tourism uh, assets. And it's again, how would be creative to allow people to enjoy those assets, but still be safe? I think collaboration is now one of the new buzzwords in business and uh, without doubt people will be looking for strategic alliances, they'll be looking for collaboration, they'll be looking, I mean, if you think about it, the whole area of uh, social distancing, you know, I mean, um, one of the things that people will be looking at perhaps, uh, could they put up marquees on their lawns, etc. and problem with hotels and different things, how do they achieve uh, do they actually interlink rooms with TV cameras and videos so that people could be at a wedding in four rooms rather than one room? And I have no doubt people are giving this a fair bit of thought at present. But make no mistake about it, I think the person, the customer, will be looking to see that innovation because, above all, the customer will be very health conscious at present. I think what they do, first of all, it goes back to that initial cash flow I said, they cut down to the very bare minimum, the minimum cost they, they can incur in order to be ready to open up again. And then once they do that, uh, they may well have to, to borrow uh, in addition to the grants that they may have qualified for. One will need some money to carry over. To, and, and equally, remember when business reopens again, it may not be able to, just, to produce cash profits the first couple of months. It may have to be phased back and scaled back. Uh, brought in on a scaling basis. So, uh, yes, I do think so. I mean, obviously, the, the two grants, the um, the £10,000 grant or the £25,000 grant for the retail and hospitality sector, uh, tourism sector, is, is particularly good if you qualify it. Obviously, uh, the rates held is another one. Um, deferring VAT, PAYE, deferring your HP, these are all very useful. Talking to your suppliers and deferring as much as possible. But, but the truth is that... Um, Yes, if you believe that when your business is up and running, whatever the new model would be, and I do think the most important thing here is that this does give us an opportunity at present to re-engineer our business, to look at what was best and learn what worked, went well. And to be honest with you, maybe this is the time to take out the clippers and cut the things that didn't go well. And maybe this is also the time to take stock and to really ask ourselves honest questions. I mean, for example, is this a good time in terms of contact with staff or whatever? Would they mind uh, less doing a few forms, opportunities for improvement? What would you do? Ask the staff, you know, there's an old Japanese proverb, none of us are as smart as all of us. Use this time to ask the staff, have they any OFIs, opportunities for improvement? Because you'd be amazed the ideas you'll get. But the truth is, in terms of the government supports, yes, people should use whichever ones they can. Because obviously, if you take even the, um, you know, the, the, the COVID loan, the, 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 uh, the coronavirus dis inter disruption loan, I mean, that's interest free for a year. That's, that, that's, a, that's a very big perk. has to repay back over six years. And to be fair, the, the bonus loan scheme, the, the, uh, the bounce back loan scheme announced should be very attractive for a number of small operators in the tourism and hospitality sector. And then we're starting to see hopefully some signs that uh, there will be exit planning and recovery opportunities in the not too distant future.
obviously one needs to keep themselves abreast of uh, tourism and I, what's happening there and the research and suggestions they're coming forward or indeed uh, hospitality Ulster. But I think in the broader context, uh, this is an opportunity to do some strategic thinking. And, you know, there, there are a number of strategic tools which you can adopt very quickly and use very quickly. I think most of us are familiar with SWOT analysis, doing a quick analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunity and threats. And, you know, whenever I was at university, unfortunately too many years ago, um, opportunity Opportunities and threats. There was a little tool called pest analysis to look at political, economic, social, and technological factors. That has now moved on to what they call pestle. And what that really means is that none of us can operate in an exclusive bubble. We have to look at the periphery of what's happening around us. So therefore, we should look at the impact on our businesses of political, economic, uh, social, technological, environmental, and legal are the last two. And in, in, in that context, obviously, we're always looking at risk assessment and how we can do things better. And you know, the great business guru, Michael, Michael Porter, he said, strategy is about making choices. It's about trade-offs. You know, he also said it's about differentiation. And within PKFFPM, we have uh, developed a thing which we call the PKFFPM rocket. And it's to, to give business a direction. And we suggest that, believe it or not, even this, uh, this is an ideal time. It doesn't take that long. I, I've seen us do it in two hours. But quickly to refocus, where are we now? And where do we want to get in light of the changing circumstances? And you can see that this rocket really starts with a vision. And uh, yes, vision obviously reflects your, your core values and your core focus, but it's where you want to be. But then thereafter, then you must put in place a, a strategy and a structure and how you're going to implement that vision. And then ultimately, the culture. The culture is really important because the culture is the glue. It's your DNA that brings everything together. It's back to those things we were talking about, you know, connecting, uh, empowering, evolving. Um, and I would suggest that, to be honest with you, the culture has to be really focused probably on three core elements. Make sure we're focused on relevance, sustainability, and trust. The word trust being, to be honest with you, tied into not only our staff, not only our suppliers, and most importantly, our customers. Working on trust, authentic leadership. And then you have five operational programs in the rocket. My view that once you look at any business and you take the skins off it, you can focus it down into five operational plans. So having decided your vision, your strategy, your structure, your culture, you then move on to your five operational plans. And we talked about earlier on, remember OFI's opportunities for improvement. But look very quickly, what are your products and services? How are you gonna differentiate yourself in the future? What is your marketing and sales? Is it going to be a lot more online marketing? Is it going to be maybe live streaming? Uh, we leave people to the end because business is all about people. Systems and processes. What are your under, What can you learn from the past? If you are restarting again, what would you do differently? This is the time to think these, the re-engineering of your business. And finally, finance, physical and resources. Now, that brings you back to the fifth underlying operational plan, which is people. And I think what we're really saying from day one, from this whole interview in our chat has been the importance of people, empowering your people, encouraging them to be, uh, to be inspirational to their fellow colleagues, to inspire their colleagues, to be energy. But at the, at the end of the day, we also need everybody rowing in the same direction. So no solo runs, but I believe this model does enhance a business's organization to put in place a little bit of structure, but it's not too complicated, but it does allow for strategic planning and ultimately, you know, <laughs> failing to plan is planning to fail. So, uh, you know, you've got to remember your decent suppliers who supplied you prior to COVID-19, uh, they certainly wouldn't expect you not to have come to some arrangement with them. And again, the key here is communication. Uh, you really should have communicated. I touched on that earlier on, you remember, but you should have communicated with your suppliers in order to come to some arrangement if possible in terms of the payment. Because honestly, you need those suppliers. You're going to need good suppliers going forward. And it's, it's good business sense. It's, it's, it's back to what we talked about, communications. Really, you know, uh, you cannot, uh, you cannot underestimate the importance at this particular time of communications, keeping in contact with your staff, 
to your suppliers and don't forget your customers. Look at new ways to, to communicate with your customers. Look at new ways to try and say, this is what we're going to do when we come back. Don't know yet when we're coming back, but these are the ideas. I mean, how did you handle your people with vouchers? How did you handle, you know, these th people remember. And if you build up trust with your customers, I honestly believe people will come back to your business. I'm not sure we have to change our mindset. Hopefully we had that adaptive, uh, that whole concept of agile, flexibility, adaptive, uh, changing to meet the market demands, having the, the confidence in your own staff to do that, the confidence in your management team. But there's no doubt about it. Uh, we need to be observing what's happening around the world. For example, I spoke to our, my, my colleagues in PKF China uh, last Thursday, and they were telling me that the offices were back, manufacturing was back, schools were starting to come back, but actually the, uh, the hotels were not just yet back. Um, but again, looking at, you know, there's other people ahead of Northern Ireland in terms of the COVID curve and to see how their tourism and uh, hospitality industry have come back. And certainly, so I would say, uh, no, the DNA should be good, but you're looking for the new trends. You're looking for what behaviours do you think? I mean, remote working looks as if, let's be fair, I think you're never going to be back exactly the same position in work either. But remember, we used to have all, we, we moved to very tight spaces in offices. Maybe we may have to move to different spaces. We could see construction sites now working maybe from four or five in the morning to very late at night because to limit the amount of people on the site at any one time in the factory. Are there opportunities? Are there opportunities for the tourism and hotel sector to service that? Oh, fundamental. I think we, we said that before. But, but equally, take, put yourself in the staff. You know, you think about it. How do I differentiate myself? Well, now, do I lie around all day when I'm off? Or do I actually go and educate myself? Do I go and develop a new skill? Do I come back with innovative? Do I, for example, contact my employer and say, hey, hey, Kieran, you know, I was just thinking there. Or, hey, Kieran, I was observing something happened in Iceland. I think we could take that concept, slightly change it. Do you think, is there a market there? I mean, is there a way we could use our assets differently? You know, we've got to encourage staff to be you know, resourceful, innovative, and uh, certainly in terms of planning for the future, the fittest will survive. But, you know, any business that didn't have innovation at the heart, you know, you innovate or you evaporate. So, you know, that's not COVID-19, that's core culture. And, you know, you look around you, you're seeing, you'll probably see streamlined menus. You, 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 I, I do think you'll see people maybe in order to achieve social distancing also eating at a normal eating hours. You know, I, I believe there'll be, you might even have the all-night cafes coming. You mean actually people saying, you know, if you want to make sure there's only 10 in the restaurant, come at such such a time, we guarantee there'll be no more than 15 in it, et cetera, et cetera. That will add the cost. So then those costs must be incorporated into the price of the product or service. But I think if we go back to the individual business, it's how we put in place an agile strategy, which will allow us to adapt to changing market circumstances, which will allow us to utilize our core why, why people would come to us for our business. You know, if you think about it, you know, it's not the what and the how, it's not what we are or how we do it. It's actually, it's, it's what benefits our results that we're going to provide to the customer, which they will believe will enhance their quality of life which will meet their satisfaction. So if I'm suggesting one thing, it's perhaps time to focus, to focus more and more on the why and how can we deliver the why for potential new customers. Well, without doubt, the, the, key, uh, the key starting point uh, for the tourism and hospitality sector in the current environment is to attract the home market back and the market from Ireland and the market from the UK and mainland. And uh, particularly the island of Ireland, first of all, because again, you may have people a little bit reluctant to fly uh, or, or, on boat, or uh, boat, uh, travel by boat, etc. cetera. But, but there, yeah, there's no doubt about it. We've got to be very conscious. What are the, is, is, you know, is that a different, that is a different spending habit. Uh, you know, uh, it's a different type of customer. What is going to be their average stay? Is it going to be a two, three day stay? Is it going to be short stays? And, and again, that, again, we talked about the senior citizens. How do we make sure our hotels are as busy on a Sunday 
as they are maybe on a Thursday. And, and again, how do we, you know, one of the ways is business tourism is quite important. I mean, is there something in terms of you think that we believe that um, there will be a lot of stretching out of shifts, et cetera, in order to uh, accommodate social distancing? Is there something there we can do in terms of the servicing of the food, in terms of accommodation? You know, I mean, I, there's, you're unrelentless in what potentially could happen. You know, never, I would never doubt the creativity or intuition of, of people, but uh, you can be sure of one thing. If we listen to all the experts, thankfully COVID-19 is, you know, it is temporary. And that, that's really very, very important. I think it's, and, you know, as a species, we are vulnerable. But thankfully, as I keep saying, I also think we've demonstrated in Northern Ireland over the years, particularly the tourism and hospitality side, that we're resourceful and we're innovative and we're creative. And uh, I think if we stay positive and stay strong and have confidence in our own ability and that of our team, I think we can move forward with confidence.